am an East Texas girl. I have lived in East Texas my entire life, except for about three months when I, uh, three years when I lived in Florida. I have um, a brother and a sister, uh, older brother, younger sister, and we lived in a family of um, a very conservative family, a Beaver Cleaver type family, and we loved each other and we did things together and we love Texas, we love East Texas. When I was about 13, my mother taught me to sew and I made my clothes all through junior high, all through high school and then I stopped sewing for a while and when I was about almost in my late 30s, I have an aunt or I had an aunt, she's passed on, who started quilting at the age of 65. And she made big quilts, big king size quilts, all with scissors. And she used a sewing machine, but she cut everything out by hand. And I was just intrigued and I would love, I would love to see what she made. And then I had another good friend that was in quilting and I, it, it got me started down the quilting road. Uh, when, Clay was, when Clay was born, I actually wanted to make a quilt for him and ended up not doing it because while I, while I knew how to sew, I didn't know how to quilt. I didn't know how to piece, but I didn't, it took me some time to figure that out. So I finally figured it out and I made my first quilt and then I opened Stitch in Heaven. You know, quilting spoke to me because it is a very um, stress relieving hobby. At the time I worked for a major corporation and I did a lot of traveling and I would take my quilting on the airplane and the stewardesses would ask me about it. And I would do it really for stress relief. Is, is when I very first started, that's what it was for. It was like a, uh, something to get away from the, the drama at the office. And so that, that's how quilting came about with me. The turning point for me to, to get out of corporate America, when I was in corporate America, I was there for 20 some odd years. And one year I realized that my son was in the fifth grade and I had never spent a summer with him. So I went to the powers that be and I said, I'd like to have a summer off without pay. And they said, no. And so I did the next most logical thing. I quit my job. And so at the time we were living in a, a, a major city and we were thinking about after I quit my job, what could we do? My husband worked out of our home. We could basically live anywhere. So we decided that we would raise emus. And so we got all involved in the emu community and we found a beautiful place in Haynesville, Texas. And we built a big old house there on 200 acres. And um, the, the emus did not happen, thank goodness. However, during this time, I really got kind of bored and I needed something to do. And I'd always thought, you know, opening a quilt shop would be so much fun. So I went out and started looking for a place to put a quilt shop and I ended up in Quitman. So the emus didn't happen, but quilting did. And that was a very good thing. When we opened in, or when I opened my store in, in Quitman, I opened in a thousand square feet in 600, with 600 bolts of fabric. And in the beginning, we had our grand opening, we had our ribbon cutting and everybody came and, um, you know, yeah, this is gonna be great. And of course, then they would leave the store and they would say, I'm sure they said, there's no way she can, put, she can sell fabric for $7.99 a yard, because that was quite more than what most places were, were selling it for. And I can remember there was a point in time in my journey that I stood at my cash register at the end of the day and I had $35 in the till. And I looked out at the parking lot, the parking lot was empty, so I wondered what I had done to make everyone mad at me. Well, of course, everyone wasn't mad at me. I just needed a plan. And so I set out on a plan to grow my business. And now we are 17,500 square feet and growing and we have a lot more than 600 bolts of fabric. <laughs> I definitely had a business plan. However, 
business plans go by the wayside. You know, in this type of business, you just really kind of have to use your gut and you have to use your instincts. And so that's what I did. And what I did from the very beginning, I think that um, some, some shop owners do, but not all, is I really listen to our customers. And listening to the customer is the thing that has helped us to grow more than anything. We are always listening to our customers. We always survey our customers. We always take the feedback that we get, whether it be on Facebook or from a survey or from an email. This place is awesome. And we adjust to what our customers want. Our customers are wonderful. Our customers are generous, they are giving, they are supportive, and they are some of the most creative people that I have ever met. Um, and also, they support us like we're family. Not only do we feel like they are family, but they feel like we are family. And so, without our customers, we would not be what we are today. Oh my, Stitch in Heaven, what does Stitch in Heaven offer? You know, we started out, or I started out as a, just a quilt shop. And we just had fabric and we had classes and we had books and patterns and quilting. Now we are a full service entity for quilting, is what I would call it. We offer block of the month programs, we offer travel, we offer quilting cruises, we offer now our Land Ahoy events, which is an event that we developed when the cruises were put on hold back in the pandemic. We offer our, our events at our retreat center. We built a 9,500 square foot retreat center, very nice, just for our customers so that we could have, we could host uh, events that, that people wanted to come to. And not only can we host that event, but they're right across the parking lot from our store. So it's a really great, great marriage of what quilters want in quilting. Our customers have been very ex um, complimentary. Our customers have been very supportive. Our customers have given us some really great feedback for improvement. And our customers are um, the type of people that will tell us how wonderful we are. They'll also tell us where we've gone wrong. And that's what we want them to do. We started uh, October 11th, 1996. And in Quitman, Texas, population 1895. And now we are back in Quitman, Texas after a little journey to Mineola for a few years. On a campus of uh, a 12 acre campus, we have a 17,500 square foot main building that we use as our showroom, as our office space, and uh, as our service center for Bernina sewing machine, uh, for Bernina and, and Handy Quilter sewing machines. We just finished a 9,500 square foot retreat center with six cabins or cottages, we call them. And we are about to embark on a 30,000 square foot expansion that will include warehouse, office, and event space. It's going great. <laughs> when we finish our, build, our current building project, we'll have over 60,000 square feet in Quitman, Texas. Setbacks, oh my goodness, uh, of course everybody talks about 2020. And of course for us, the big setback in 2020 was not being able to fulfill our cruises. And that, that has been very painful for us. However, Sitchin Heaven is known for the kind, to be the kind of company that does the right thing. And we have stood by our customers and we've made sure our customers' desires are fulfilled with that. You know, I have always had the, uh, the philosophy that there is no such thing as a failure. There is um, a, some, when, some, when something doesn't work out the way you want it to work out, it's an opportunity for you to learn and to be better and to know what to do or to not do the next time. You know, equipment is very special. Why equipment? I was raised in Tyler and I am an East Texas girl. And when we moved, uh, to, the, to the East Texas area, we looked at a lot of different areas and we found this little piece of land out in Hainesville and we could have located our store in Mineola or we could have located our store in Quitman. 
Quitman just felt right. Quitman is a beautiful small town like no other. It's giving, it's loving, they, the people in Quitman care about us, we care about them. It was a great place for Clay to grow up. It was a great place for Clay to go to school. He had a great education and Quitman will always be in our heart. The idea for Stitch in Heaven actually came because I was in corporate America working on some little quilts and I thought how cool, and I, I would visit my local quilt store and I would go home and I would tell my family how cool it would be to be able to, to have a quilt store. I'm just like everyone else wants to, they, everybody wants to have a quilt shop. But of course, at the time, there was a quilt shop and plus I was working in corporate America, I couldn't do that. But when we moved to the country, it opened opportunity for me to explore that and so I did and I found Stitch in Heaven. In the year 2000, we were named one of the top 10 quilt shops in the United States and Canada by Quilt Sampler Magazine. And that really put us on the map. People would bring their magazines in, mainly for my autograph. <laughs> but really when people were traveling and going on vacations that year and for years after it, I just, um, I was amazed at how many years after that people would still bring that magazine in and be able to say that they had gone to Stitch in Heaven. When we built the building in Quitman in October of 2019, we were building a massive building, much bigger than I would have ever have dreamed that my little quilt store could, could go into. And we, we moved into that building in October of 2019, and within a year, we had outgrown that building. It was, and this was during the pandemic. This was during 2020. It was just weird, <laughs> but we, we put in a lot of um, organizational strategies and we bumped up our e-commerce, we bumped up our block of the month programs, we just started working really hard because we knew we were against a challenge. And we looked at the challenges and we developed a strategy for the challenges and it worked. Our growth happened because of a lot of different things. We, instead of retreating in 2020 when the things happened that they did, we hired a PR firm and we started reaching out to our customers more and more and reminding people that we're there and that we need, need their help and support. We got really involved in the mask project and we were featured on the Kelly Clarkson show uh, back in March of 2020. That helped a lot. Uh, we were also uh, named one of, we were also named the, the Small Business of the Year uh, for North Texas, and that helped a lot. Uh, we had uh, a lot of, just more and more people were learning about us, more and more people were realizing what we were and where we were. We were featured in Inc. Magazine. Uh, so during this time, while we had a pandemic going on, and at times we couldn't even have anyone in our store, we were still reaching people. We still realized we have to still reach people and that's what we did. We, we're, we're resilient and we weren't gonna stop. We, we always pivot. We always think of another way to do something when we, it's kinda like when life gives you scraps, make a quilt. <laughs> and so that's what we did. Our block of the month program is a huge part of our business. Um, a lot of people, uh, are involved in it. I started Block of the Month programs way back in the year 2000 when we, no one knew, no one was doing subscription services and basically that's what a Block of the Month program is. We take our, we identify projects, we offer them to customers, they choose the project and then we, we give it to them in increments like a subscription. And so that's a huge, huge part of our business, and we do it very well. We have Facebook groups, we have uh, dedicated people to answer questions uh, when people have questions about the program, and we, we give really a lot of really great support. We not only, not only did we reach out to people in many, many different ways, but we started a, a YouTube channel, 
and we now have in the hundreds of videos on our channel we invite people to subscribe to our channel like the videos when they see one and this is just one more way that we can connect to people and of course YouTube primarily is providing education and providing information about what's going on at Stitch in Heaven. The types of videos that we have on our YouTube channel are going to include tutorials, are going to include information about sewing machines, are going to include information about our Block of the Month programs, they're going to include um, information about our retreats. So what we do on our YouTube channel is just try to keep people informed of everything that we have going on in a way that someone could go in and choose what they want to see and it be very personalized to what they're interested in. The proudest moment in my professional life would be when Clay joined me uh, as co-partner, as co-owner of Stitch in Heaven. Uh, you know, for a young man of Clay's age to make a commitment to get into a, a business that's not traditionally some, the kind of business that a young man would get into, let's put it that way, um, it made me very proud that he saw the value in dedicating his resources and his career to Stitch in Heaven. Yeah, my involvement with Stitch in Heaven has been all over the place. So um, when I was with Travel, I was the head of that company or division. So I was kind of running the show with that. Um, and then I got married and had kids. And so I decided that I didn't want to go on all these different cruises. And so I kind of, that was me removing myself a little bit from the company. And then when I re-entered Stitch in Heaven, I actually started as a phone answerer. So um, I was answering the phones and it just kind of got me to, to, to work the business. And I think that was basically mom's test. You know, she was like, if you're going to come in and answer the phone, if you'll drive, because I live in Tyler, which is an hour away from the shop. She said, you know, if, 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 he's, if he's willing to drive an hour and answer the phones every day for 10 bucks an hour, then, um, you know, we can talk, I guess. It was very overwhelming because, you know, as the owner's son, there's a def definite, like, kind of weird dynamic between me and the other employees. You know, I was trying to be just a normal employee, but also at the same time knowing that, you know, I was the owner's son. So it was just kind of, it was awkward, I guess is the best way to put it. And, and <clears throat> developing those relationships and understanding how to treat coworkers. And it's, it's evolved over time as I've gone up in the company, but it's still a struggle for me to, you know, a lot of the times I have insecurities about, oh, it's just Deb's son, you know. Um, so yeah, and then as far as difficulties with mom, you know, it's, <clears throat> I think our biggest difficulty is just the fact that we always talk about work. Um, you know, we are, we, we struggle with trying to stay on focus with the kids or, you know, the dinner or whatever we're doing. It always, we always bring it back to, well, we're, you know, we're doing this new marketing thing or we're, you know, this and that, and, and it's fun. And that's what we both like to talk about. But I guess that to me, that's the hardest part is just trying to separate the work from the, the personal. Well, when she started Stitch in Heaven, I was so young that I didn't really know any better, you know, um, dad owned his own business. So I didn't think too much about it. It was just kind of, I was 10 years old, I guess, when we started Stitch in Heaven. So, I was just kind of hanging around and, you know, they wanted me to help lay floors or, you know, do this or that. And um, so, yeah, as a kid, I just, I didn't have, I didn't have a lot of opinions about it. It was just kind of what, whatever mom and dad did for work is cool with me, I guess. I really got involved with Stitch in Heaven in about 2018. Uh, or re I, that I consider that to be kind of when I, you know, because I'd left travel, I'd been gone from travel for a while. 2018 was when I started answering the phones in, in Mineola. That was the first time that I'd gone to the store you know, on a consistent basis, actually working in the store. Um, and I just walked around and I, I guess I didn't really have a job title. You know, so after the phone system, I just bought a new corporate phone system because basically I was a receptionist. And so I just solved the receptionist problem by getting a new phone system with paging and all of that. So I didn't have a job anymore. And then I just kind of started going around to different departments and trying to help them uh, get more efficient and you know noticing problems like at that time block of the month didn't have a manager and so I very easily was able to say you know this this department needs management to to help manage inventory and a bunch of other things and so that was kind of 
what I saw me doing was just going around to different areas and, and helping them. I didn't, I was never told to do that or anything. Um, and then eventually I, I, the building, I said, you know, this building, we were in this 8,000 square foot building in Mineola that was really dilapidated. And I said, we should build a new building. We, you know, we have products back here in the back room that people don't know that's for sale. And if, they, if people don't know it's for sale, then guess what? You're not gonna sell it. So we should have a proper retail center and you know, kind of do this up properly. You know, we've been renting for 20 years now, like let's buy a building. The, the cruises were amazing. Um, you know, get, getting a group of people like that together of, of like-mindedness and, and the community and, and to watch them make, you, you asked me about travel, but it, to me, it wasn't about my trip. I was traveling, but it wasn't like, it wasn't my trip. It was, it was the customer's trip. And so I was trying to, um, to entertain them and to make sure they have a good time. And they, they always do. And, and it was cool just to see them grow together and make friends and lifelong friends. You know, a lot of them now travel together and they come on different trips together. They come down to Stitch in Heaven together. So watching that was, was really cool. I have, I made a quilt in sixth grade. I take that back. I made the top of a quilt. I did not quilt it, you know, it was sent off to, uh, but it was a log cabin quilt. I made it with one of my friends, David Harris. I believe we were in sixth or seventh grade and we would go up to the quilt shop every day after school and work on it for a little bit. And then we got it done. The Stitch in Heaven culture to me is a culture of growth. It's a culture where, um, Everybody knows where we're going, so it's, I feel like it's my job to paint the picture of what, what it could look like and where we wanna go and why we need to get there. And then it's my job to get everyone to agree to it and to get excited about it and to give them the tools so that they can do their job so that we can get there. You set 10 year goals and five year targets and three year, and so you basically start at 10 years and then you say, okay, if we wanna be here in 10 years, where do we gotta be in five years? Where do we gotta be in three years? Where do we gotta be in a year? Where do we gotta be this quarter? Where do we gotta be next week? And so it's a roadmap. And if you follow the roadmap, you know, inevitably you'll get there. Now granted, we changed the roadmap along the way, but <clears throat> it, it gives us a true north all the time. Well, right now we just broke ground on our warehouse. So like I said, for the e-commerce <clears throat> side of things, the warehouse will be a very big part of that. We'll be able to have a lot more events going forward. Uh, we have a big 4,000 square foot uh, event space up there. So I see it becoming a larger destination. I just see it growing. As we're able to grow our e-commerce, our name will get bigger and more people will know about us. That will bring more people to Quitman. I see a lot of growth for equipment as well. You know, I think there can be a lot.